From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, this is Crosswalk. Last week in our Survivor Series, we looked at what the Bible has to say about surviving failure. This week, we're looking at surviving the opposite, surviving success. It may seem strange to think of success as something you need to survive, but as we'll see today, if you're not careful, success can get you into trouble. Now, here's Pastor Clay with Surviving Success. We are in a series entitled Survivor. Hence the slide you see behind me. We are, we are in a series entitled Survivor because life is a series of challenges and obstacles that have to be survived. Hey, uh, Tyler, Travis, can we have somebody bring the lights all the way up in here if we could when we get a chance? I don't think they're all the way up. Um, that life is a series of challenges and obstacles that we are intend it to survive. And I would remind you, as I say that, that, that God's, God's uh, expectation, God's understanding of surviving as a follower of Him is not just getting by. God's understanding is thriving in the obstacle, in the uh, challenge, right? Come on, because this... That's not what we want, right? We want the obstacle gone. We want the challenge out of the way. And that's how we, we pray, and, and perhaps sometimes that is part of what God wants to do. But, but this I can assure you, God wants you to thrive in your challenge, in your obstacle. Last week uh, in this series, we uh, brought a message about surviving failure uh, from the book of Jeremiah. And I had a number of you that uh, contacted me or talked to me and said that how much you needed to hear that message. Praise God. But I wonder how many of us need to hear today's message about surviving success. Surviving success? I thought success is what we wanted. I thought success was the goal. I thought we want to be successful. Why, why would I ever need to survive success? I thought success was, was something to... I don't even know what to do. I don't know where to move. So I sit down over here. I thought success was something to be celebrated, not survived. And obviously that's true. We should celebrate successes in our life. We should want to be successful in our life. Successful as God defines it and not as the world defines it. And any of you that have lived longer than five minutes probably know that those are usually two very different things, how God defines it and how the world defines it. Sure, success should be celebrated, but success sometimes may have to be survived. Or maybe a better way to think of it is not necessarily surviving success, but surviving some of the results of success. So today, we're going to open our Bibles, and I encourage you to do that now if you have a copy of God's Word with you. Open your Bible, please, to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, you can open a digital copy, a hard copy. The text will be up on the screen as well. Joshua chapter 7, and I want to share with you as quickly as I can this morning four steps that you and I need to take to survive success. What do I want to do with you today? What do I want to give you? Four steps for surviving success. Thank you, baby. My wife got, yeah. Yeah. Four steps to surviving success. Four steps to surviving success. You maybe even never even thought about needing to survive success, but I want to try and help you understand how that can, can be needed at times in our life. I'm going to read the text as I go today because of the length of the text, but I'm going to start by just reading verse 1. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1 this morning says this. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. 
For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. Father, today, as we dive into your word for a few moments, uh, I just ask for clarity, uh, that, that you would give me the ability to communicate clearly, that you would give each person who will hear this message today, whether it's live in this room, whether it's by podcast, whether it's by video, that you'll give them the ability to clearly hear the message for the application they need in their life right now. They might be in a place where their life, where they would just, where they'd love to have, have a success, have any success. Maybe they're at a place in their life where things are going well and they've seen success in areas of their life. God, wherever each of us are in our particular station in life and and point in our lives, may you bring application today in a way so that, uh, God, as I I always pray for these people, that they'll leave this place today and say, "It, it was good to be there. It was good to worship God. It was good to look at his word. I've got something that I can take and apply to my life. God, that would be my desire Uh, that I'd be able to do that as your messenger boy today. In Jesus' name, amen. Here is the first step that you and I need to take to survive success. Be aware of temptation after success. Be aware of temptation after success. The nation of Israel is... It, it, let me just explain. It, it, in chapter 7 here, it, it, in the chapter just before this, in chapter 6 of the book of Joshua, chapter 6 is one of, the, one of the great victory chapters in all of the Bible. Israel had wandered around for 40 years in the wilderness. Most of you are familiar with this story, but Israel had wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unwillingness to move forward with God, right? Y'all remember that story? They wouldn't move forward, and so God said, all right, you gotta go back out. And so for 40 years, they wandered around in the wilderness. It happens, right? It happens. How many of you can think of your life and say, you know what? I've done some wandering around in my life at times before, before I was ready to move forward with God. It happens. But 40 years later, here they are. Moses has died, and God has raised up Joshua to lead the people into the promised land. And buddy, they're ready to go. And they cross over the Jordan River, and they come up to, and this all, all this is in chapter 6. They come up across the Jordan River, and they come to the city of Jericho, the mighty city of Jericho. Historians say that the, that the walls of the city of Jericho were estimated to be at least 30 feet high and that they were, they were so thick, so wide, that two chariots could race side by side on the top of the walls. They were massive. And the people of Jericho thought that they were impenetrable because of that. They thought that their city could never be conquered because of those walls. But God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, one who spoke it all into existence, caused those walls to literally fall down flat. As it says there in Joshua chapter 6, and the people of Israel went straight up and took the city of Jericho. It was a tremendous victory. But in Joshua chapter 6, and I think verse 17, it says... It specifically says, Joshua specifically told the people that everything in Jericho, all the goods, all the supplies, all the wealth, everything in Jericho was, as the text says, under the ban. Now, that simply meant that it was off limits to the nation of Israel. They were not to touch anything in the city of Jericho. They were were not to take it as plunder. They were not to take it as spoil. It was under the ban because, and here's why, because God had made it clear that Jericho, as the first city they conquered when they moved, it, moved into the promised land, Jericho was intended to be what the Bible refers to as a first fruits offering. A first fruits offering to God for, for the promised land and for what they were going to do in the promised land. Now, 
A first fruits offering is designed really to be a couple of things. It is, first off, a thank offering. First fruits is a thank offering. It was a way for the people of God to say, thank you. Thanks for what you've done. Thanks for your provision. Thanks for everything. And so to give God the first part of what he gave to them, that was simply a way of saying thank you to God. But first fruits is also designed or intended to be a faith offering. It is a way of saying, God, thanks for everything that you've done. And by the way, God, I believe you for everything you're going to do. God, I believe that you're going to make every provision for us along the way. By faith, I choose to believe that you're going to make that provision for us. This is not, listen, this is not part of the message, but I have to stop here and say something about first fruits offering. I have to, I have to say this. Because it doesn't take a, a seminary degree to figure out that for you and I today, the tithe is the equivalent of our first fruits offering. It is our ability to thank God for what he has provided for us. And it is our ability to thank God to, or to have faith in God for what he is going to do in the future. And why is that so important? Why is that such a big deal? Because here's what I want you to understand. This first fruits offering was and still is a very big deal to God. Not because God needs it. We need to understand that. But because the people of God need to give it. Because, and I, I quote this a lot. You guys, you guys know this. Oh, here he comes again. Hebrews uh, chapter 11. And it is impossible to please God without faith. And so everything in our lives, in one way or another, should build off of this this. Thing called faith and how we are in, in my relationships and in, in, in how I have a relationship with my spouse or in my work situation or what I do with my money or my time. All these things are, should all be centered. It's crucial that it's centered around this thing called faith. We say it a lot in Christian circles, right? We throw, we throw the word faith around a lot. It's really a big deal to God. And so this first fruits offering was and is really a big deal to God. So in Joshua chapter 7, a guy named Achan is about to find out how big a deal first fruits offering is to God. You see, after this great victory, after they had they'd taken the city of, of Jericho, after the walls fell down flat and they went up and, and took it, they come in, they, and Jericho was a prosperous city. Jericho had lots of stuff. Now listen to me. Achan knows. God has communicated clearly. Achan knows it's under the ban. Achan knows that everything in there is under the ban. Achan knows it's a first fruits offering uh, representing what God is going to do for, the, for the, all the rest of the promised land as they move on into it. He knows he's not supposed to touch it. But that's what I'm saying to you. Be aware after success temptation will oftentimes come your way. Achan comes across a stash of gold and silver and some very valuable clothing. And like I said, he knows it's under the ban. He knows it's off limits. He knows it belongs to God. But can I tell you this? I guarantee you, Achan found a way to justify taking it for himself and stealing it from God, which is essentially what he was doing. Because God says, this belongs to me. Don't touch that. Don't touch the first fruits. Why? Not because God needs it, because it's always about faith. They needed to have faith that God was going to trust, that God was going to provide for them the rest of the way, just like we do as well. And Achan takes some of the things under the ban. Be careful. Be aware after success in your life, and they had a tremendous success, be aware that temptation very well may be coming your way. Uh, you, you guys may not have seen this because I could only find it uh, showing in one theater uh, in this area, but a new movie opened this weekend entitled Borg versus McEnroe. Any y'all, any y'all see the trailer for it? Any y'all care? <laughs> Borg versus McEnroe. It's the story, basically, I mean, it's about their live stuff, but it kind of centers around the 1980 Wimbledon Championship Final, the greatest tennis match ever played. Don't, that's... I don't even want to hear anybody else say anything else. The greatest tennis match 
ever played, 1980 Wimbledon final, Bjorn Borg versus John McEnroe. Now, I'm not, I'm not endorsing the film, okay? I, I mean, I'd be honest with you, the trailer looked awesome. I would love to go see it, but it's rated R, and so I, I'm not, I'm not going to see it. But, uh, so I'm not necessarily endorsing the film because it is rated R. But some of you know that Cindy and I used to, used to play tennis. I used to play a lot of uh, tennis back in Florida, back in the day. Uh, so obviously it was of interest uh, to me. Bjorn Borg, who, who won, spoiler alert, he, he won the match. <laughs> if, if you went around back in 1980. Go, but you can watch, you can go, by, go, by the way, YouTube and go back and watch like the highlights of the match. It's unbelievable. 18-16 tiebreaker in the fourth set. Unbelievable. Anyway. Anyway, I was, I was a fan of Bjorn Borg. I mean, I, I even had Bjorn Borg's tennis, I mean, not his exact tennis, but I had his model tennis racket, a Danae Borg Pro. I had it, man. I, I admired his game. All, I, I was never a two-handed backhand guy like he was. Anyway, <laughs> I do digress. Anyway, Bjorn Borg retired at 26 years of age at what most people would consider the height of his athletic ability as a professional. And he truly was at the height of his ability as a professional tennis player. He was number one in the world. He had won six French Open championships. He had won five straight Wimbledon championships. And the world was shocked when he announced his retirement at 26 years of age. I remember reading an article in Tennis Magazine, I think it was in Tennis Magazine, after his retirement, where Borg said, he said, I got up one morning and I was walking around my one of, I don't know, he had three or four houses, I can't remember, homes, and he said, I walked into this room just full of trophies, room full of trophies. He said, I looked at my bank account, and, and I don't remember, but he said, it's like $120 million dollars in the bank. And he said, I said, you know what? I don't want to get up anymore at 6 a.m. and pound tennis balls for eight hours. I don't have to. I want to sleep in. See, Bjorn Borg allowed the temptation of, of the success that he had had to Cause him to be satisfied with where he was. Do you understand what I'm saying? Cause him to be satisfied with where he was so that there was no motivation to move forward. Beware, that's what I'm saying to you. Be aware of temptation that can come after success in your life. <laughs> Sorry. I'm looking, we've got to think. Stop moving so much. We think the popping is your pack. <laughs> okay, all right. It's hard for me to preach like this. I'm going to tell you that right now. Is my chair here? Okay. (laughs) Beware of temptation after success. Now listen to me. You, if you're here and you're married, you may be having success in your marriage. I hope you are. Be aware that temptation can come your way. Temptation to... Just take it for granted. Temptation to take your spouse for granted. Temptation to not work at it as hard as as maybe you have in the past. Temptation from another person. Maybe you have experienced some success in your spiritual life. I hope you have. Beware of the temptation to just think, you know, I'm doing pretty well. I've I've come along. I've learned some of the word of God. I've made some application in my life. I'm doing pretty good. And you and the temptation can come to just say I'm 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 doing all right. Maybe you've experienced some success over a particular uh, struggle or temptation that that you've had in your life. We all have those, right? Some particular those ones that we don't talk about in in, in public. Some particular struggle or temptation. Maybe you've had some some success, some victory in your life. I hope you have. Just be aware that temptation to think you're doing okay or that you don't have to, oh, I don't have to worry about that area in my life anymore. I got that one down. Be aware that temptation is coming probably to your life, okay? All right, you understand? Because listen to me before we move on. Satan only succeeds if you fail. That's the only way he gets any victory in, in, because he's already lost the cross, right? He already lost at the cross. 
the empty tomb. He's already lost that. Satan only wins if you lose. So don't expect the demonic forces of hell that are still active in some way working in this world, do not expect them to stand up and applaud when you are successful. Expect them to try to knock you out, knock you down, and keep you from greater success in your life, which is where God wants to take you. God's not satisfied with the success, successes you have had. Why should you be? Here's the, here's the second uh, step uh, this morning that I want to look at. Beware of, be, beware of self-confidence because of success. Be aware of temptation after success. Beware of self-confidence because of success. Let me read verse uh, 2 through 5. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Haven, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or three thousand men need go up to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there, for they are, they are few. People in Ai, they're, they're few. So about three thousand men from the people went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai The men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shabarium and struck them down on the descent. So the hearts of the people melted and became as water. You know, I think it's it's so ironic that 40 years earlier, the Israelites send in spies, right? Check out the land. 40 years earlier, they send in spies to check out the land. And they don't move forward because they have no confidence that they can take the land, right? Now, 40 years later, they send spies in again, this time to to scout out AI. And this time, they have way too much self-confidence that that they'll be able to take the land. Because in both cases, here's the deal. In both cases, they forgot. They forgot. You and I forget sometimes. They forgot. It's the Lord who wins the battle. It's the Lord who wins the battle. They forgot it 40 years earlier when they said, oh, we, we, can't, we can't take that land. There's giants in that land. We can't take that land. They forgot that it's the Lord who fights and, and wins the battle. And 40 years later, they forgot that it's the Lord who fights the battle because apparently they didn't even bother to check with him. They just sent, Joshua sends spies up and he says, check it out, see what it looks like. And they come back and they said, AI who? That's just a little old place. I wouldn't even worry about it. Joshua, don't even bother sending the whole army up there. My goodness, they're nothing. Two or 3,000, that's plenty. Let everybody else stay back and relax. And they got their behinds kicked. They got their behinds kicked. People lost their lives. Beware of self-confidence after success. Now listen. Listen. They're, uh, they're not, I want you to understand this, they're not overconfident. There's nothing wrong with being overconfident. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there's nothing wrong with being overconfident in what God can do. There's nothing wrong with being overconfident. You can run over with confidence in the midst of some struggle or difficulty and say, I absolutely know my God is going to deliver us through this situation. God's going to work. God's going to do amazing things. Nothing wrong with overconfidence in God. That wasn't their problem. Their problem was self-confidence. They forgot that it's God who fights the battles. They forgot. They forgot. I'm glad we don't forget. They were self-confident that they could do this thing. Listen, that's a danger. Beware of self-confidence. Hey, remember? Look what happened to Apollo Creed. Y'all all know? Y'all remember Apollo Creed in Rocky one? Not in Rocky 17 or how many they made. In Rocky 1, you remember in Rocky 1? Apollo didn't even hardly train, did he? he didn't, his manager's like, come on, you got to train. He said, I'm Apollo Creed. I'm the undisputed, undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. And I'm fighting a, a no-name white guy from Philadelphia. How hard can that be? Beware of self-confidence after success in your life. Listen, 
in the world, in athletic endeavors. It, it, the idea of, of being self-confidence is touted. And there's truth in that. Man, you, you have to have belief that your abilities, your skills, your training, your practice, you have to believe that you can have some success. There, there, there's, there's truth in that. But when it comes to following Jesus Christ in our spiritual lives, there's no place for self-confidence. It has to be in God and what he can do. Maybe you've seen these passages of Scripture before. Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They, they've got chariots, they've got horses, but they say, we, we know that ultimately that's not, that's not what does for That's not what wins the battle. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by what? Say it. My spirit, says the Lord. Listen, beware in your life. Beware. I, think I look out here and I think some of these students sitting out here, some of these folks coming up and moving towards middle school, high school, graduation, going off to college, going off into the military or into the, to the workforce or whatever kind of things. And it's, it's, it's so easy sometimes to be overconfident in where you are in your relationship with Christ not knowing what you're going to face, not knowing that you're going to walk into a classroom with some guy that's got more degrees behind his name than a thermometer and he's going to sit there and tell you how, how oh, God is just a myth and God doesn't exist and, and he'll, and, and he, because he doesn't have to present any evidence. He doesn't even have to look at the evidence to, that, that is, is overwhelming in the reality of the existence, but you walk in and you walk out of that class because this guy, this is the professor, and he's, well, he must be right, and I'm just telling you, guys, beware. Okay, here's a, a third idea today. Be willing to change for more success. Be willing to change for more success. Okay, verse 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord. This is after they, they've been whipped by a small little band in AI. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, both he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we'd been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. In other words, it would have just been better if we'd stayed out in the wilderness. For a long time, they said, it'd been better if we'd stayed in Egypt. Now, 40 years, well, it'd just been better if we'd stayed out in the wilderness. Oh, Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their back before their enemies? They're running in defeat. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and they'll surround us and they'll cut off our name from the earth and what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, rise up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them and they have even taken some of the things under the ban and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also uh, put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Rise up, consecrate the people, and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, has said, There are things under the ban in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things under the ban from your midst. It is reality check time. Israel runs for their life from little AI and they run back down and they're, now listen, let me say this. We're gonna get to Achan's, the consequences of Achan's sin in a moment. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, it's gonna sound harsh to some of you in here. But I want you to understand a couple of things about this, okay? One of the reasons sometimes when we see the, the, the judgment of God falling, and listen to me, it was harsh. It wasn't unjust, but it was harsh. 
But one of the reasons that this judgment and others that you sometimes read about Scripture is going to sound harsh to your ear, to some of y'all's ears, I'm just being completely honest with you right now, is because for too long, the church has soft-pedaled the holiness of God. That's the truth, folks. We have, because it's an easier sell, we have, we have promoted and pushed the, the grace of God and the love of God and the mercy of God uh, towards people. And of course, all of those things are true. Of course, God is, is, is loving and merciful and kind and, and patient and, and forgiving. Of course, he's all of those things. But because that's an easier sell for people, we have neglected to tell them that he is also a God of holiness. He's a God of holiness. And his grace and his love and his mercy do not compete with his holiness. They work in perfect unity together. So that the judgment that's going to fall on Achan is a result of God's holiness and his love, grace, and mercy, by the way. Because if he did not judge it, Achan and others would have continued on in that sin, heaping, piling up sins and and consequences for their sins upon themselves, and that's not good for anybody. So they get their behinds kicked. Uh, Joshua and the elders gather together uh, uh, there in front of the Lord and they just start, they start wailing and crying and they start throwing ashes on their head and tearing their clothing, which was a, a Middle Eastern way of expressing grief. And they go on for hours, for hours doing this. And finally God says, get up, get up. What are you crying about? There's sin in the camp. Now here's what you need to do about it. Listen to me. People sometimes think, well, you know, right or wrong, if, if what I do it doesn't bother anybody else, that's, that's my business. That, that's not how it works with God. That's not how it works with God. Your sin, my sin, affects more people than just you. And that's what God said. The, Joshua and the elders, they weren't the ones that had, had stolen the stuff under the ban. But they were the representatives to the people of Israel. And so God said to them, get up. You, there's stuff on the band. Here's what you need to do about it. And they were to go tell the people of Israel. By the way, can I say this to you as well? God knows who did it, right? God knows who, who took the stuff under the band. All he's got to do is say, Joshua, it was Achan. Go get him. But he doesn't. He says, here's what we're going to do. Go tell the people in the morning. I'm going to call them out. I'm going to call them. going to going to by lots, we're going to cast lots, we're going to see which, which tribe, and when we get the 12 tribes, and I'm going to get the families, and then I'm going to get the sub-families. So why, why would God do all that? You want to know why God's doing all that? Grace. Grace. God's giving Achan the opportunity to change. You see, that's what it requires. You want to move, you want to move ahead? You want to move forward? You've got to be willing to change. I have to be willing to change. If I've allowed because of success or, or because of whatever. If I've allowed sin into my life, I have to be willing to acknowledge it, repent of it, turn from it, and, and, and get ready to move on with God. I have to be willing to change. Achan is not willing to change. He's got, he's got plenty. He knows he's under the ban. He knows the announcement's been made. Here's what God's gonna do in the morning. He's got all the time in the world to come, to come clean and say, it was me, I did it. God, I repent, please forgive me. But Achan thought he could get away with it. Achan thought he could hide his sin. And even if you hide it from, from whoever for some period of time, it's never hidden from God. Can I say this also? Achan did eventually repent when he was confronted with his sin, when it was, when, when it was found out. But listen to me, it was too late. It was too late. I, I, I'm just, I'm speculating here, but I am willing to bet that at the judgment of God someday, when all of this comes to a conclusion, which may not be far off, by the way, I am of the belief that at the judgment of God, there'll be a lot of people ready to repent then. 
but it'll be too late. What is what does the Apostle Paul say? Second Corinthians quoting from, I think, Isaiah chapter 49. He says, look, the right time is now. Look, the day of salvation is here. It's now. This is when you need to change. That's what you and I have to be willing to do. Because you find a God of grace and mercy desiring to receive us. You understand? This is not when judgment falls on Israel, when judgment falls on Achan. It's not, it's not God takes no delight in that. You probably know this passage of Scripture, Ezekiel uh, chapter 33. As surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn. Turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? But you've got to be willing to, to come clean and change. Daniel uh, chapter 9, Daniel expresses that for the nation of Israel when they were carried off. He says, we have sinned, we've committed iniquity, we've acted acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. That's what it takes, a willingness to change. Okay, wherever you are in your life, maybe there's something in your life that you you just know it's not not right, it's not what God would have for you, it's not God's best plan for you, you think it is, or the world thinks it is, or it feels right, or or whatever else. Listen, I'm just saying to you that you have to receive what God says in his word, what he says that is best for your life, you have to receive that, and if if you've allowed something into your life that doesn't belong, you have to be willing to change. You got to do what God says, you got to do what God says. All right, one uh, more idea. Uh, this morning I want to share with you. Be ready to move on to greater success. See, I want you to hear this. This is the goal. The goal is not to sit back and celebrate past successes. The goal for God, for you, is to take you to greater successes. I'll say it again. God's not satisfied with the successes you've experienced in your life as a follower of Jesus Christ. Why should you be? Verse uh, and I'm pick it up in verse uh, 14. In the morning then, you shall come near by your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes by lot shall come near by families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come near by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come near uh, man by man. And it shall be that the one who is taken with the things under the ban shall be burned with fire, he and all that belongs to him because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has committed a disgraceful thing in Israel. So Joshua arose early in the morning and brought Israel by tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken and he brought the family of Judah near and he took the family of the Zerahites and he brought the family of the Zerahites near man by man and Zabdi was taken and he brought his household near man by man and Achan son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah was taken. And then Joshua said to Achan, my son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, truly, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, all that stuff that glitters in this world, 50 shekels in weight. Then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. I don't have time to read the rest of the chapter. You can do that, but let me, but let me say this to you. Achan, all of his belongings, his sons and daughters, even his tent were all brought out. Achan and his sons and daughters were stoned to death. And it was all burned up. All of it burned up as things under the ban. We've soft-pedaled the holiness of God. Now, keep a couple things in mind here. They were his sons and daughters, but they almost, almost certainly were grown adults. And they it's a virtual certainty that they were involved in the theft and the deception with him. Well, how do you know that, Clay? Because Numbers chapter 24 says that children are not to be held responsible for the sins of their 
parents, and parents are not to be held responsible for the sins of their children. This was a family affair. They were all involved in this, and they all could have repented when they had the opportunity to. It's hard. But God doesn't play with sin, ladies and gentlemen. We do. God doesn't. Because of the destructive nature of sin, because of the virus, the cancer that it is, and how it spreads in our lives and spreads into other people's lives, into our family's lives, and, and into a nation's lives, on and on and on, because we play with sin. We justify sin. We, we... In uh, chapter 7 opens w- with this. Chapter 7 opens, but the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully. In chapter 7, uh, God said, Uh, that is why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now, Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer until you destroy the things among you that were set apart for destruction. That's that's Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 8 opens with this. Now the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear or be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. In chapter 7, basically basically you have have people messing it up, and in chapter 8, you have God straightening it up. But it came down to this. The people did as God commanded them to do, and they were ready to move forward to greater victories. To take Ai and to move right on into the promised land and all of the other areas that God had been promising them for hundreds and hundreds of years, land that was theirs, because God had already, had already signed it over to them. And they were able to move forward into greater and greater and greater victories. But there has to be a willingness, be ready to move forward. You know, uh, it's a question I can ask you. Are you ready to move forward with God into greater success in your life? He wants it. You know, I was amazed, I was reading this week that 88%, almost 90% of all of the companies that were on the Fortune 500 list in 1955, 88% of them are no longer on the list. They're no longer, most of them are not even around. Few merged into others and a few still exist, but they're no longer on the Fortune 500 list. Part of the reason that companies sometimes fail is their inability to to move forward in, in in their perspective area one such company that you and i would most of us would probably be aware of is a company by the name of blockbuster video yeah right blockbuster video apparently had a problem looking forward, moving forward in their industry. The, the iconic, really, name, Blockbuster Video, in the, in the game, movie and game rental industry was, I mean, at their height, can I tell you this, at their height in 2004, Blockbuster Video had a little over 9,000 stores. And they employed close to 100,000 people worldwide. But they apparently had a problem with seeing the future and moving forward because I didn't know this, but in 2000, at, at the height of their greatness, a little fledgling company by the name of Netflix that was struggling came to Blockbuster and offered to sell themselves to Blockbuster, sell Netflix to Blockbuster for $50 million. The CEO of Blockbuster didn't want to do the deal because, as he put it, Netflix was a small niche or niche company and it was losing money at the time. So he didn't make the deal. Maybe he should have been a little more forward thinking because by 2010, Blockbuster had filed for bankruptcy. And as of 2017, Netflix had worldwide earnings of $8.8 billion. (laughs) 
You, you, understand, you understand what I'm saying? Man, celebrate past successes in your life, in your walk with Christ, and your desire to honor Him and to be pure, to be holy, to walk with Him. Celebrate that, man. Celebrate what God's, man, God, this used to bother me so much, and God has, God has met me in this place, and I, and I can see how God's given me victory. Celebrate those things, but, but don't be satisfied with those things. You got to be ready to move forward. That's, that's how you survive success the way God wants you to survive it. Let's pray together. After the victory at Jericho, the Israelites thought the little town of Ai would be no problem. But as Pastor Clay talked about today, their past success led them to big trouble because they were relying on themselves for the next success in their lives. They forgot that the Lord is really the one who brings success. You and I need to be aware of temptation that can come after we've had success. Satan is never pleased with our success, and he will bring temptation that will lead us away from God's best. Fortunately for us, God is ready to take us forward to even greater success in our spiritual lives when we confess our sin and trust in Him for the victories. We invite you to join us on a Sunday morning at Cross Culture Church. We gather each week in a casual and contemporary atmosphere to celebrate the goodness of our God. Cross culture may be a little different from what you're thinking. Sure, we're a church, but instead of religion, we're about a relationship, a community of believers where Jesus is revealed in the lives of each person, real people who truly care, solid biblical teaching from Pastor Clay Stevens, and the most energetic, fun, and safe kids program around. Find out more at crossculture.church. Cross Culture Church in North Raleigh, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.